encouragement. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Acts 15 with me. Acts 15. Can't promise anything, but we may get to verse 35 tonight. But we're going to start in verse 16. I know we've been in Acts 15 for the last few weeks, but we have such rich content here and a pivotal point where we see, you know, you have the Gentiles and the Jews being saved together. And we see that culture clash and religious clash and uh, you have uh, men who grew up not observing law saved and men who did grow up observing law saved and so we have spent the majority of the time proving that salvation is by grace through faith alone and Christ alone they had a couple questions come up there in Antioch and Syria where if you remember they came into the church and they were like well you got to observe the law you got to be circumcised in order to be saved and we see Paul and Barnabas withstood them stood up to them and taught grace and if the church said it was good for them to go to Jerusalem and there to meet with the apostles and the elders and the pillars of the church and there they talked about it they had uh, other Jews who were actually saved Jews who were saying, well, maybe not so much keeping the law saves you, but certainly we should have keep the law after we're saved. So they even disputed about those two things. And then we have been looking at the proofs of grace, how their, their verdict was that it's by grace through faith alone and Christ alone without works, lest any man should boast. But in verse 16, we see... James, uh, actually James starts in verse 13. Uh, we'll go ahead and start there, Acts 15 and verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Si uh, Simon, which is Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take them a, a, a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from the, among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased that the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barab, uh, Barsabbas and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, Amen. that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, and they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, 
they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace to us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you, Father, for saving us as sinners, Lord, that you came to us, you saved us by your grace and by your power. You brought us to yourself, Father, to call you out of people, that we are your children, that you've blessed us. And Lord, we are so thankful. All we can be is thankful and for anything that you give us. Father, thank you for the night. Thank you for those who are faithful. Father, who have come tonight to hear your word, to learn, to pray, to worship to you. Father, we, we do thank you, Lord, for those who are listening out through Facebook. Father, if, Lord, that there's any that are out there who are lost, Lord, that you know. Of course, Lord, we know that you know your lost sheep, that today is a day of their salvation. Father, may we preach the gospel and we be faithful in your word. Father, to be faithful and true and established in your word. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight, the, really, the title of the message and what we hope to really cover, like I said, we may not get to verse 35, but I wanted to read the entire context, is the acts of fellowship. So really, it has gone from the doctrinal question. Remember, we had dealt with that. We know it's by grace through faith. We saw that it was by prophecy. We saw Jesus fulfilled all history. We saw that uh, Jesus is the justifier, and you cannot be justified from the law of Moses. We, so we dealt with the doctrinal and the conclusion, and then James stands up, and he says, okay, we all know uh, what Peter shared with us, and we know from prophecy that God's going to save the Gentiles. And so we know this, these type of people, the Greeks, those who have not shared in our rich culture, in our rich history as Jews, are being saved. They're God's people. They're God's chosen people. God has put upon them an everlasting love. You know, they're not second-rate saved people. They're that we're all sinners saved by grace. And so uh, we see that. But now we must come to the point where we need to fellowship with each other. We need to get along. And so imagine, you know, we go out, we have this revival and 200, 500 people show up and the Lord saves every one of them. Now you have 500 brand new saved people. You're going to have some problems. <laughs> You're going to have some, a little bit of problems in the church, you know, here and there. Now you're saved, but you know, everyone's condition is different. We're going to start talking about the fellowship here. It's not just, hey, Jews, leave the Gentiles alone with your burden of works, but hey, Gentiles, leave the Jews alone with your liberty. Okay, so we have to understand the Gentiles and the Greeks have come from a very loose background. And they're coming into salvation with this liberty. And so we see Paul discuss this, and we're actually going to look in a lot of different places. I really hope we have time to look tonight. There's, we re, we're really going to look at Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8 uh, a lot tonight. Because this is, this is a good subject. It's a big subject. I mean, Romans 14 is entirely devoted to this. You, you'll start hearing the term stronger brother and weaker brother in this. But in verse... Um, let me flip over here again. In verse 16, well, actually in verse 19 is when he really starts here. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which among the Gentiles are turned to God. So now if you remember, our, our two things that we really drove, I, you may not remember, so let's go over them again. In verse 1, actually, um, yeah, verse 1 of chapter 15, there was somebody, what started it all was there was somebody, a Jew, who went into the church, the Gentile church, the Christian church, and said, you must be circumcised after the manner of Moses to be saved. And then verse 5, uh, after Paul and Barnabas had arrived at Jerusalem, uh, there was a certain of the sect of the Pharisees who were believers, saying that, 
it was needful to be circumcised. So the first one was you need to observe the law to be saved. The second one, you need to observe the law to be sanctified, to grow and um, to be a strong Christian, to be a pleasing Christian to God. You must also observe this physical, mandated, dietary, ceremonial, all of these feasts, anything, the Sabbath that they, that they observed. Um, so really, James comes up with this sentence that we trouble them not because, again, we've learned that it's by grace through faith of salvation. So we've dealt with the salvation part. That's over. That's settled. That's done. The law does not add to salvation at all. Baptism, whatever. Lord's Supper, whatever. Church attendance, nothing adds to salvation because you cannot add to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You can't add to what's already perfect. And so, uh, you know, not only is that doctrinally incorrect, but it, is, it makes no common sense because you're trying to add your dirty works because we all have dirty hearts, right? We, we all have hearts who have... Uh, passions and desires and the hearts desperately wicked who can know it even even the good deeds we do have some kind of hints of selfishness behind it uh, even when you're trying the, your hardest not to be selfish you're still selfish and so whatever good work you do is tainted coming from a dirty vessel so you can't add that work to Christ's perfect holy and righteous work which God has planned before the beginning of the world. I mean, God has done what he's done wonderfully. And the things of which we can say, you can't disagree. Or the things that we can see, you cannot disagree. Look at that sunset and tell me that's not beautiful. God's done it well. God has done everything he's done beautifully. Now imagine his most beautiful work. And his most beautiful work is salvation, is redemption through his son. Jesus Christ. And so if you try to add to that beautiful work, it's like you're trying to add to the sunset, or even more. So, so let's just get rid of that idea. Verse 1, you're gone. It's by salvation, through faith alone, without works, by grace alone, in Jesus Christ. The Jews had no problem with that. <laughs> right here, they're like, no, let's, let's not do that. Now, as far as sanctification goes, as our Christian life, now we're all gathered together. The revival's over. We're all saved. We're all in here together. Now, how do we live a pleasing Christian life? How do we bring honor to God? Your background might be much different than mine. Your age may be much different than mine. I was saved at the age of eight. So I didn't have a lot of I didn't have a lot of evil living before I was saved like some people may have if they're saved at 45 or 50. I don't know. I mean, I've heard testimonies and the you know, it, it isn't it wonderful when you hear testimonies of the more wicked life they had and when the Lord saved them and now you know them for who they are, how much more grace and praise that brings God and brings glory to God. It, it brings attention to God's power because only his power can change somebody's heart that way and their life that way. But some people have that background where I, I may not necessarily have that background. So let's talk about something that we see here. For the sake of fellowship. So this is wise. This is... I mean, we know that the Holy Spirit inspired the words, but for this question to be so new to the Jews and to the believers, it's a new question. They come up with a very wise answer. And the, the answer is, is uh, in verse 19, wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. So we're going to talk about these four things. Now, before we really concentrate on the what, what is it that James required of the Gentiles to observe? The main question really today for us is why. Why did James come up with these four things? It's not so much the what did he come up with. You know, a lot of the, 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 the issue, or some Christians believe these are the only commandments you have to keep. And everything else is liberty. But that's ridiculous. 
And then the other vast difference of that is some Christians believe that this is, um, a lot of this is, is literal for us today. But back then, we need to understand the why. Now, of course, fornication is. But we'll talk about these four. But here's important things to understand. These four commands. The Gentiles needed to be careful. These born-again Gentiles needed to be careful not to offend the Jews. Not to offend the Jews. To needlessly violate the Mosaic sanction would have destroyed the church's credibility with unbelieving Jews and also believing Jews. It would have been an abuse of freedom in Christ's believers and joy. So if you are a Jew, you do not eat meats that were offered to idols. If you're a Gentile, you do not have that same conviction. And so, you know, you're going to go and if you're going to act out and just trample all over the law, you're going to offend the Jews, even if they are believing Jews. And you're not going to give much credibility to the church when you go out and you act recklessly with the liberty which God has given you. Um, now, uh, 1 Peter 2.16 says, As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. The, the main point is here is do not offend and do not sin. You're saved. Brand new in the church with a bunch of people. Do not sin. Do not offend. Consider your brother. Consider your sister in Christ. Consider their background. Consider their temptations. Consider their struggles. Your struggles are not my struggles. Some of them may be, but my struggles may not be your struggles, and some of them may be. When I am dealing with one of my struggles, you may have the temptation to judge me. And if you're dealing with one of your struggles, it's not my struggle, I might have the temptation to judge you as a weaker Christian. So we need to understand each other. And so we do not offend, we do not sin, and also I believe James is really writing to this, the why, again, not only do not offend the, the Jews because they have issues with meats given to idols, they have issues with those things strangled and with blood. They have issues with dietary laws. Not only that is, I believe it's also a indicator to the Gentiles that not everything that you came from in your Greek culture is okay with God. You're born again and you have liberty. You may not have to be circumcised, but that doesn't mean you can go sin all you want and what you used to do in your old culture that God saved you from. And we're going to see more of that. So I believe those are the two main impacts that James is having with these four items that he lists. First of all, pollution of idols refers to food that's offered to pagan gods and then sold in temple butcher shops. So if you will, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now we'll deal with this a little bit. And we'll deal with this and Romans chapter 14. This may be good places to keep your fingers on. Now when we, in our Roman series, we will get to Romans 14, one of these days, uh, and then we will go over this again. But this really is talking about the stronger and weaker brother of Romans 14, and then here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Really, a lot of this, we can read, we could spend a long time on this topic because it's, it's so prevalent to us. It's it's mentioned a lot in the Bible, this aspect of faith, this aspect of weaker in the faith, not weaker in faith, but weaker in the faith. You can have strong faith, but you may not have be as strong in liberty uh, as others. So it deals with this topic a lot. We're not going to be able to exhaust it all tonight. Um, we'll deal with it as much as we can, though. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse... 6, uh, I'm in 2 Corinthians, excuse me, it will definitely take longer if I'm not in the right chapter, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, but to us there is but 
one God, the Father, of whom all are, th- um, whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all, I'm sorry, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And though thy knowledge shall, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now, do you all understand that? So, we'll talk about the meats here. If you're doing something that the other person has a bad conscience of doing, well, let's go back to the backgrounds. One of the, one of the examples that I bring up is Christian rock, right? So let's say that you were saved and you used to be in a motorcycle gang, you used to drink, you used to go to concerts, you might have even been in a rock band, you used to listen to ACDC, you used to do all those things, and all of that activity was associated with the, the lifestyle you were living, the lost person you were. All of the rioting, the fornication, the, all of the debauchery, everything, and, and one of those things was associated was rock music. Now, you've been saved. Now it's hard for you to even listen to rock music at all. You don't even turn it on. Even the Christian rock offends you. Even all of that stuff offends you, okay? So you're not wanting to listen to it. Now let's say somebody who was, like nowadays, Christian rock's everywhere. It's on the radio, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Someone who has just been saved and has grown up with Christian rock not let's say they're saved at 10 years old or 12 or whatever and they never associated rock music with sin I mean is there something wrong with the drum in of itself no there's nothing wrong with an electric guitar in of itself no those objects are not sin just just like the meats that were offered the idols the objects were not sinful it was how you associated that object so, if, if I'm a young Christian and I love Christian rock and I don't associate rock and roll with sin and I can glorify and worship God and the lyrics are good, you know, they're truthful lyrics, they're sound words, I can listen to that and not be offended, then I'm not to turn around and say, oh, here, here's, here's my friend Ned who used to do all that stuff, who associates Christian rock with sin, I'm not to turn it up on him, right? And offend him. It's not so much about the offense. What it's about is I don't want to lead Ned to believe, oh, if Philip's listening to rock and roll music, then I can listen to rock and roll music. And as soon as Ned starts listening to rock and roll music, it becomes a slippery slope for Ned. So Ned not only uh, listens to rock and roll music against his own conscience. Remember, he, he associated that sin. He associated the drums, the electric guitar, everything with sin. And against his own conscience, he is going to say, okay, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to get back into it. I'm going to dust off my electric guitar, you know, and I'm going to get back into it because Philip's doing it and he's, he's at liberty to do it. He's not offended at all. And so what I've done is I have somewhat caused the chain reaction in Ned. And Ned, not only does he, he start, he may start well with just Christian rock, but then he slides right back in into those old things. 
He went against his conscience. He thought that doing those, listening to that, doing that, he was sinning against God because he was going back to the old way that he was before God saved him. But those things in of themselves were not sin. Now that's, that's the line that we've got to draw. There is no weaker or stronger brother when it comes to sin. It's gray area. It's things that are not sin of themselves. Okay? So fornication, it doesn't matter if you're Ned or Philip, it's sin. It doesn't, you, you, you can't spin that. It's sin. Sin is sin. But, um, I mean, there's other instances you can probably think of. Um, I, actually, I was trying to think of, of, of stuff like that. I mean, um, I got to, from facial hair to, I don't know, non-alcoholic beer. I don't know who, I, I've never tried any of those except the facial hair. Kind of like it. Um, <laughs> Brother Chapman reminds me. But, uh, and uh, <laughs> he did. he's like, all I can see, brother, is that gray beard. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just one of those things, but that's not, those aren't good examples because I'm not going to tempt Brother Chapman to growing a beard and then slip into some sinful lifestyle because he has a beard. That's what it's talking about, is these meats offer the idols. So if you're still there in chapter 8, in verse 10, it says, For if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak? Now, that the one who is weak is associating the thing that's not sin of itself with sin. Him which is weak, be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren... And when they're we conscious, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend or sin, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So that is part of the pollutions to idols. And we can really, uh, we don't have time. I wish we did, but I, I can read, just write this down. Romans chapter 14, verse 1. It says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, um, but not to doubtful disputations, for one believeth that he may eat all things. Actually, let's just turn over there real, real quick. I, I, if we're going to stay on this subject, I don't see us going to the next one. Let's uh, finish this one with a good, uh, strong place to read together. Romans chapter 14, verse 1 says, Him that is weak in the faith. Now, what does that not say? It says, Him that is weak in faith. Now, look, okay, keep. Keep your hand here, and this will bless you here. Turn, keep your hand here. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. Paul makes a distinction between those who are saved versus those who are not. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 10 says, Now, he is talking to those who are trying to add law to grace here in Galatians. In Romans chapter 14, he wasn't. And Galatians chapter 4, verse 10, he says, Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. And so he's not talking about those who in, chapter, in Romans chapter 14, he is not getting on those who are doing the law, you know, for sanctification the big difference is, is in Galatians he's speaking to those who believed these things were necessary for salvation as in Acts 15 1 but in Romans 14 and in Acts chapter 15 5 this is what is believed that will make a stronger Christian towards sanctification they have a genuine faith now this is a weaker brother they have a genuine faith but it is weak or has a deficiency in it in verse 14, 1, notice that it says, him that is weak in the faith. It doesn't say him that is weak in faith. So it's him that is weak in, he doesn't have as strong a liberty in the faith. Uh, Receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, 
And let him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So here's really the, con the solution. Because how are you going to go around knowing what's offending everybody to sin? That's going to be a hard life to live. I, I don't know what offends you to sin. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, if I do know, I'll, I'll try with all my heart, uh, and especially if it is not a sin, you know, to not do that in front of you if you slip back into that sin. And you've got to remember, this is more prevalent. Now, remember the prevalence that we see here. We have the Jews and the Gentiles coming together, right? So um, the solution is, is both of you be mature about it. Both of you. Don't let one offend you and don't judge. So that's really the conclusion in verse 3. Let not him that eateth, the one who has liberty, despise him that eateth not, who has a conscience not to do what you're doing. Don't despise them. And let not, and let not him which eateth not, the one that, who, does, who does have a conscience and cannot do it, let him uh, which judge him that eateth. Let him not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. And that's what he goes in verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord. He doth not regard it, he that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why doth Dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, for it is written, as I saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Isn't that beautiful? So at the end of the day, if you don't know what to think, start thinking about the ways which you may be offending somebody. Don't dwell on how somebody's offending you. At, you know, if God has received my brother, so should I. And that's what that's saying. And if it's, and if it's not flagrant sin, we didn't even get to things strangled and we didn't get to fornication uh, fornication is, is straight up sin I uh, really wish I could have got to that or we go till nine uh, either one <laughs> that you want but put this message in context of who it originally was written to the Jews and the Greeks culture clash in the church both wanting to be godly both saved now Try to take the same elements. Now, we saw Paul says, um, you know, um, we didn't get to read all, all of the places that Paul talks about it. But um, he says, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. He says, you know, meat is for the belly, and the belly is for meat. But if it's offered to idols, I have no problem eating it because it doesn't burn my conscience. But if you grew up in a system where that was sin, it may be harder for you to do that. And so your conscience is not right before God. So try to take that and put it in today's world. Christian rock music was one illustration that I could come up with that in of itself, like the music, the instruments, was not sin, but somebody could have associated rock music with a sinful life. There's other elements in people's life that they may have. Now, listen, it doesn't say, you know, walk around on tippy toes that I'm afraid I'm going to offend you. It's not about that. It's walk around on tippy toes that your liberty doesn't cause somebody else to slip into sin. We're, we're not to be easily offended as God's people. We're all sinners by grace. We're, I mean, like I said, my issues aren't yours and your issues aren't mine. 
And we need to pray and love for each other and have each other's best interest in heart. If you're having an issue, is there any way I can help? Not, hey, give me a reason to judge you and talk about you. You know, that's not our hearts. What he's talking about here is don't do something in your liberty that somebody else is having a hard time with who just came out of it. Who just came out of it and he sees, hey, he's been a Christian for 35 years and he's, he's doing this. I, 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 let me go do that and then all of a sudden you're the reason that person slipped, went down. So let us be mindful of those things. So do not sin and do not offend is, is the, the word. Don't worry about being offended. Worry about being the offense. And so keep your heart humble. Let's all pray. Or let's all pray.